Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you are tuning in. Thank you for being here and today we're going to be talking about a new topic, one that uh, spans many centuries and many cultures, but in this case we're going to be talking about the Annunciation. So this is a topic that is very relevant and present in Western art history uh, books and museums, but it's a topic that has a lot to do with every every culture in the world, which is these are moments of spirit or moments of dialogue with what you consider to be um, higher than everyday life. So what we'll be doing today is looking at various images of the Annunciation of the Archangel Gabriel and Mary um, and their dialogue and see how, especially in the Renaissance, how this image is presented. And we will look into the different topics, uh, symbols that pertain to this image, but also um, what is this devotional tool or what is it, how do you portray the connection between a human being and the divine. So stick around. look at our topic of the day, which is, I called it moments of spirit. Even though we're going to be talking about the Annunciation in its various forms, I wanted to look deeper into that subject and see it more as a dialogue. As I was saying at the intro, it's a dialogue between what you consider to be or what whoever is painting considers to be spirit and the everyday or the human or the person. So today we're going to be looking at different depictions of the Annunciation. And just to recap, the Annunciation is when um, Mary is visited by the Archangel Gabriel and he is going to announce to her that she is to be to become the mother of Christ, the mother of the Savior. And it's a very well-known topic within all of art history from, from the beginning, well, not so the Paleo Paleo-Christian, but from the Middle Ages onward, we're going to see a lot of Annunciations. And it's a topic that I wanted to talk about because it's the first picture that I showed you, the first painting of the Prado that I showed you in our first video is about the Annunciation, which was Frangelicos. But this time, we're going to go see beyond the Prado and see many examples. Now, when you go into museum, there's always going to be topics that are presented once and again, especially around Christianity, because we're talking about the Western civilizations where Christianity has made a lot of art. However, this is not necessarily a topic only of the Christian religion. It's more to do with the relationship you have between these powers that I was saying, the person and the spirit. So let's look at different topics of different variations of this topic. And as you can see in the image here, we're going to go through quite a few pieces, mostly of the Renaissance. But as I was saying earlier, it's within Christianity, but if you um, dig deep in it in any religion, you're going to find the dialogue with the sacred, the, um, the personal experience of the sacred. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the Virgin Mary receiving a message from the Archangel Gabriel. But if you look in any other uh, religion or philosophy, there is a, uh, an example of how, how does one have a communion with oneself or with, uh, with what we consider the divine. In this case, you have the Chinese here presented, but we're going to be seeing other examples throughout today. So we were talking about Frangelico, and this is another Annunciation, and there's certain topics that are going to be always present within an Annunciation. Always two figures, evidently, Mary and Gabriel, and they're going to have some kind of dialogue. This can be presented through physical uh, demeanor, through their eyes, sometimes through uh, a message 
coming out of Gabriel's mouth. So the message is literally written out. So that's one thing to look out for. Another is how does how is Gabriel presented? Winged, what colors? He is very much um, very often presented in more softer tones, as an angel more considered to be feminine or more soft, yeah, vocal, evidently. Then how is Mary presented? What is her initial reaction to being visited by a messenger of God? And also, not in this one, but we also see the presence of the Holy Spirit, a lot of the times through a light, through a dove, some kind of symbol that represents spirit. The first piece that we saw, if you remember, this here, we saw this Holy Spirit presented as rays of the sun coming to Mary. So that's another thing to um, look out for. Another one is Mary's always reading a book and there's always somewhere around lilies or these flowers that symbolize Mary's virginity, her purity. So there's all these symbols that are that make it easy to recognize when you're looking at an Annunciation. That's another thing. I'll be showing you how to spot Annunciation. So this one is clearly a very uh, austere representation, and it was placed at, sorry about that, it was placed at, at the um, Monastery of San Marco. So this is in Florence, and what we're seeing around us is a representation of the monastery itself. We have a little cell at the backdrop, which represents a cell of a monk. So what we're seeing is how would have would this image be uh, taken by a monk? It would have he would have probably seen it as something familiar because he lives in surroundings like this. So that's going to be happening a lot. We're going to see, um, you know, personal personal experiences of the divine are easily presented when you make things personal. So in this case, a monk's every day is presented in very austere elements. Now, the next one that I want to see is Da Vinci. So an artist that needs no introduction. He was very well known for his natural and his nature uh, presentations, as well as, you know, he was almost basically an engineer. So what we have here is, again, what is the relationship between Mary and, and Gabriel? Here's a close-up. Look at this. There's almost like a triangle or an arc ranging from her to him, from him to her, and their eyes are meeting. She is taken aback. Here's the book that I was mentioning, and there are the lilies. There's always going to be halos as well to represent that they are um, holy. But what do we have in the backdrop? We have a whole city, and we also have a very uh, well-represented presence of nature, which is something that you would typically see in a Renaissance man like Da Vinci who had been studying a lot of nature. And if you look at Gabriel's representation, it's very much an eagle's um, wings, very different from what we were seeing in Frangelico, which was much more the softer tones, each um, more um, mystical or fantastic idea of what an, a wing is. In the case of uh, da Vinci, we have a much more realistic sense, and he or she, this is very much a um, a feminine portrayal of of Gabriel, is blessing Mary, full of grace, as the saying goes. So there's that dialogue presented with them. Now another one is uh, one from the north. The Renaissance in the north of Europe happens very differently from the Renaissance that we have in Italy and around the cent center of Europe. So what's happening in the north is that there's a lot more art that is being made for less, uh, less well-to-do patrons, but very, very rich indeed. So we have here to uh, probably the merchant here who has paid for this painting by Van Eyck. Uh, sorry for, it looks like Van Eyck, it's Campa. So this is a Flemish master. And what we have is a very everyday scene of the Annunciation, as if you were in your own living room and you received a message from God. So Mary is by the fireplace in exquisite garments like the patron's wife would be. And we have the angel coming in almost silently as if uh, not to disturb her prayer. Then we have over here 
again, the Holy Spirit and their dialogue. It seems as if it's the beginning of Gabriel's announcement. She has not yet heard the words of God. Now I found this little one, which I thought was very cute. It's of the Middle Ages. It looks uh, earlier than what we've seen before. But just to show you how very, um, very definite it is to figure out when you see an Annunciation. You have somebody that looks like Mary, a woman draped with a halo, and then an angel next to her with some kind of image or um, s sign that is saying, that it, as if he is saying something. So for any Christian of the time uh, seeing this, it would have been very, very easily represented to see the Annunciation. So, so this piece is here in, in France at a side door of the church in saint Cernin, but one of those, um, the column's capitals, has this image. Now going back to a more Renaissance style, we're going to be seeing Simone Martini, but before, here are a few more examples where you see the basic elements of an Annunciation. Always an angel you, uh, on the left side and Mary on the right side. A lot of the times Mary's going to be reading a book. Here you see them, different books, but still reading as if she's very pious. You're going to see the presence of the Holy Spirit um, in forms of dove, or here you have the rays. And you're also going to see some kind of element that tells you Gabriel is speaking. The hand gesture is very typical, but then you also have images like this, where you have the scroll of the person of Gabriel speaking. So this is early, early Renaissance. We have Giotto, Bonsegna, Guido di Siena. Uh, this one here is in Toledo. We have no, no artist's name, but it's, you kind of get the idea. So when you go to a museum and you see something similar, you'll know it's an Annunciation. So here we have the Annunciation by Martini, and this is one of the most famous ones that we have. Now, if you look, their relationship is very much um, during the announcement. So imagine you are, you know, doing your thing, having your book, reading, and suddenly you get a message from God, from the messenger of God, saying what Gabriel said to Mary. You're going to bear a child and he's going to be the savior. So if you see her expression and her demeanor, she is both um, awestruck and blessed, but also shy or uh, a lot of the times pious is what artists of the time would have seen her as. And in this case, look at how Gabriel, it seems almost like he has just flown in with these garments flying. And I got a couple of um, very, very good images for you to see. This is tempera. So this is oil on, um, so mm, a type of uh, tempera, which is uh, um, not yet oil painting. It's a type of um, pigments on wood and it's exquisite how it's been made. Now, this is literal gold being used for the piece. And then we have the book here, which is parted in the middle with her hand. So this is the beginning of the Renaissance where we start to see Mary as a human woman, more of uh, the natural pose, but it's still very iconographic in the sense of, for example, we have the halo and we have the words being thrown towards her from Gabriel and we have the lilies that I was mentioning. So you start to see it's it's pretty common symbolisms that you see once and again. Now this one is also of the time and Filippo Lippi presents another way to show dialogue, which is through a semicircle right here and almost divided. So it's as if we have the division of human life and spiritual life. And that's one of these main uh, messages that the Annunciation gives us. How do we bring in the sacred? Or how do we use these images and look at them as a devotional tool to bring in the sacred into our lives in the everyday? So here she is. Um, it seems like she's holding something, a book actually. It seems almost, almost like a baby by this time. So we know that Gabriel has come here to tell her she will bear a child. Here's the Holy Spirit and here's the lily. So it's all there, but look at the, uh, their relationship between their eyes. So Gabriel is very secure and uh, 
warming, heartwarming to her. And she is almost stunned and, you know, taken aback for the message that she has received from God. So the halos are also something cute that I think are beautifully presented. Look at her demeanor. She is um, blessed as receiving such such words from God. And Gabriel is very much the softest angel that there is within within the story of the archangels. Now, almost towards the end of our, our uh, narrative today, I wanted to show you the archangel Gabriel and Mary in the Annunciation by Botticelli. This is the end, well, not the, the middle end of the Renaissance, and you can definitely tell there's a different uh, style. So we have this um, setback, the point of perspective. It's a beautiful way, almost Da Vinci-like. But what I'd like to focus on is their relationship. So there is something going on here that we had not seen before in the, in the paintings uh, prior. So yes, Gabriel has come, knelt, and given Mary the message, and she is awestruck as she's been in the others, but here there's more of a dance going on, and there's something here, almost energetic, between their their glances. And Botticelli really went into the idea of receiving a message of God and what that would mean. Also, the exquisiteness of the wings is just extraordinary. And the flow of her body, of the draperies, of, yes, she is, you know, completely ecstatic for what she is receiving, but at the same time, she, she's taken aback. So like, yes, but, but wow. It's an, it's an aha moment or a wow moment that she didn't expect. Now, to take us further on, I wanted to take us into a few centuries later, which is the 19th century, into another piece by uh, Rossetti, Gabriel Rossetti, and this one is very different from what we've seen before. So all of them were Renaissance, but this one is different. Why, why is it still an Annunciation? How can you tell? The lilies, uh, one lady and one man, but there are no wings. So this piece makes us see that we are in a completely different context historically. But what does it mean to receive a message of God? Here's a few elements. So you have, uh, I made a little close-up for you, the Divine Spirit, the Holy Spirit as a dove, still Mary's purity in two forms. And at the, at the bottom, we see that this is the Archangel Gabriel, but with wings on his feet, almost like a Mercury, <laughs> presenting a message. And there are halos on them. And it's a very vertical painting which also vertical makes us think of the divine coming down from. So in the past, we've seen other shapes more. For example, there's a semicircle in Lippi's, or you could argue in Da Vinci's portrayal, there is a triangle. Remember that uh, perfect triangle that I've talked about before? But in uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's, there's this elongated element. It has to do with the fashion of the time. You know, the Pre-Raphaelites were very much elongated, but also it speaks of um, spirit. Spirit comes down in his painting here. Now, the other thing is Mary just is kind of still, still half asleep, which brings us to the idea that perhaps she was half asleep in the middle of receiving a message, or how many times have you suddenly woken up in the middle of, of sleeping and received some kind of message or the dream that you were uh, uh, just going through? It's a time when we're in slumber and going to sleep and, and waking up where we're kind of in this spiritual realm. And Rossetti is almost taking us to that point in this painting. So, how is your dialogue to the sacred and what is your personal experience to the sacred? Whatever you consider it to be. And I thought about this myself. I can't imagine the, <laughs> the presence of an angel, but to me, I've felt the presence of the sacred in different areas, in nature especially, in old, um, in old, old buildings like this one here in Ireland, or looking out into the woods in France, 
or looking into a, ri ri uh, you know, a river in the middle of the woods, this is where you felt, I feel the calmness to feel the sacred. Other cultures have it their own way. Meditation, uh, going into seclusion or into the woods for a few weeks or months in a, in a year to spend that time with yourself. So it is through these inward motions that the sacred comes in, the dialogue that we can um, invite through other means. In the past, it's been very, very much structured as somebody visiting uh, Mary and having a message to say. But in our terms today, how would we feel if we uh, receive a message and what would that look like? And this is what I wanted to talk to you about today, your own experience of the sacred and how, how much uh, time or how do you open this window to receive the sacred, however you understand it. And this dialogue with the higher, um, the higher realms. Yeah, since we have so much hmm, quiet time in these last few weeks, perhaps it's a, it's a subject to look into. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this beautiful experience today. Take care.